This is Tom Koslick, the head of municipal research and analytics at Hilltop Securities. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this episode of our Hilltop Talks Politics and Finance podcast series for 2022. During these discussions with subject matter experts, we consider topics that intersect the areas of politics and finance at the federal, state, and local levels in the United States. We often concentrate on issues related to U.S. public finance and the municipal bond market. Today, we are going to discuss a topic that is probably at the front of everyone's mind who has anything to do with public finance and especially city government. The topic is how U.S. cities are exposed to the remote work trend that accelerated, as many trends did, during the worst of the COVID lockdowns and that are continuing even today. To discuss the details of this very important issue, we have uh, with us today Rich Cicerone. Rich has been in the municipal bond business for 40 years. He is currently the president of Merit Research Services. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rich. We are very happy we could arrange this. Thank you for having me, Tom. Rich still conducts detailed municipal bond credit analysis, often using merit and investor tools data. In the middle of February, just a couple of weeks ago, Rich published a report based on analysis that he had been working on for some time called Tracking Municipalities' Reliance on Top Taxpayers, Exploring Commercial Real Estate Positions in 33 Major U.S. Cities. This report is available on the Merit website, and I will tweet it after I tweet out this podcast. Rich sets up this topic very nicely in his report where he writes that this could be, quote, the potential long COVID problem for big cities, as he references the small amount of COVID-19 cases where severe symptoms seem to continue past the uh, the initial point of infection and then recovery. And frankly, I'm wondering if what we're talking about, is that even going to end up being more impactful? But I, I do like that long COVID analogy. Rich, before we get into the details of report, I wanted to set the stage and talk to our listeners about why corporate real estate occupancy and related topics are so important. And I think the best way to, you know, the best way to illustrate this fact is that still almost two years after the COVID-19 crisis began, and despite the new COVID-19 paradigm and how the markets, how lawmakers and even healthcare officials are looking at COVID and, and despite the fact that there are very effective vaccines and we have had very effective vaccines for over a year, what we're seeing, and I'm going to talk about the the Castle Systems uh, Back to Work numbers. The Castle Systems Back to Work barometer is a 10-city average occupancy assessment of Castle Systems access control system data. And that number, as of February 28th, 2022, is only at 36.8%. So of those top cities, only about 37% of the occupancy is back uh, relative to where it was uh, about two years ago. To me, Rich, that is still a tremendously low number. Now we've got some, the numbers, uh, you know, are, they differ. For example, we've got Chicago, that's at about 30%. We've got Dallas at 44%, and we've got the other two highest are Houston at 51 uh, and Austin at 53%. But the like I said, that average is at 37%. New York is at 30, 31%. Uh, Chicago is at 30%. I mean, these numbers, and they did, they are still a little lower now than where they were before Omicron. But even Omer, even before Omicron, uh, it, you know, the, the number, the number was still around, the average number was still only around 40%. So, uh, you know, Rich, you have been in this business, as I said, for 40 years. Have you ever seen anything like this? Hmm. Uh, Tom, I have to say that I've seen nothing like exactly like this uh, over the years. It's not, no, been, no shutdown for more than a few days of a big city. In this case, it's all the big cities that are being affected. Uh, with these high uh, uh, absences from uh, from their offices downtown. If I was to say there's anything similar to this over the period of time in which I've been in the business, is I came into the business during a time in which uh, 
it was well known that big cities were under tremendous fiscal strain and uh, there was a deterioration in the core uh, central cities um, on, uh, on, on those places as uh, to where people wanted to work. Uh, the movement in the late 70s and early 80s was to shift uh, many, many offices into the suburbs. And you saw that great building movement in the suburbs back at that time. And uh, the buildings that were occupying the central city, there were a few new monsters that came in, such as the Sears Tower, the World Trade Center in New York. And uh, they, but they were the minority. Uh, what you saw is that that turned around as there was an architecture renaissance that came along in the mid 80s and going in then forth into the 90s in which we started to draw young people into the city and corporations began to find new reasons uh, to take advantage of the of the rising professional what we used to call yuppies that mm-hmm. came into the city who wanted to be into the city who wanted to live in the cities and and that began a, a renaissance not only for the buildings and for the tax bases, but it it began to be a magnet uh, for um, uh, for growth for those those cities. So we had a a turnaround over the years in which I've been in in the business, uh, which has really helped those tax bases. Uh, but we're in a situation now in which. We have a new cultural shift that may be more severe than the one that I started with. Mm. And the cultural shift is that people want more flex time. They want, they enjoy given the taste of what they have where they can choose their hours a little without direct supervision, uh, has been very appealing and many things, including, uh, saving costs, uh, having taken care of uh, the family, um, have been taken care of by this new flexibility that's been found in the workplace. And people are not, don't have the draw that they had at that point in time. So we'll just have to see how it's affected the entire culture for, for jobs in the city. Mm-hmm. So th- one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I, the, one of the ways that I describe this is that this is a, uh, a, a, a view of technological advance because the way even that I've experienced this is that I don't think that you know, it, after 9/11 or even after the Great Recession, we would have been able to work as seamlessly uh, the way that we are, we are now. And I think that this is be, just because of uh, the technology. I think that this is a significant technolo- technological advance. And I'm wondering if there is any anything that you have seen and or experienced that would be uh, similar to what it is that we have experienced over the last two years where technology is concerned. Would you do, how would you describe it? And how, would, is there anything else that you've seen that you compare no, this Tom, to? No, Tom, I tell you, it was a confluence of factors that uh, made it, made this cultural shift, uh, away from the office possible. And you hit it. You, you sit right on, I mean, you're right on target here. And I would have to just uh, sing in your choir on this. As I mm-hmm. say, that uh, the technology that allowed for systems like Zoom or team meetings uh, or WebEx, all of these things that came that possibly came at one time mm-hmm. to be able to bring people together to communicate, as along with the fact that the Internet itself, which came along in the 1990s, have be- allowed you inf- to allow you to actually have all the information you need at your disposal right at home. So not only the communications there, but the data you need that normally was stored in major office buildings because they needed to have a place uh, uh, which would be able to house these massive main, uh, mainframe computers. Mm-hmm. And uh, as the technology was growing during the earlier years, uh, we don't necessarily need that anymore. We have data on the cloud mm-hmm. uh, and we can store and send out messages in Excel sheets and spreadsheets. I mean, I could go on. We all would agree. We're all singing in this choir now. But the more you talk about it, you start to list the things that we have today. Uh, it's quite clear that technology came at a time in which was a perfect, uh, you might say, treatment mm-hmm. for the COVID, which required us to distance. Mm-hmm. Well, and now I want to jump into the, the details of your your report. 
Uh, and as I mentioned in the introduction, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tweet out, uh, the link to the, your report so everybody can see that if they have not seen it already. Uh, but w- one of the things that you wrote about, you know, I laid out the, the, the numbers from the Kessel Systems, uh, data and how low those numbers still are. One of the things that you wrote about in the report is about the optimism of the commercial real estate developers. Mm-hmm. And then you contrasted that with a skepticism of municipal bond analysts and mm-hmm. how that relates to recent trends and what the future holds. I'm wondering who's mm-hmm. going to be correct. Is it going to be the developers or the analysts? What do you, what do you think? Well, first of all, I have a natural bias. I come as a history of being an analyst. So that gives right. some clues where I'm going to come from. I'm naturally skeptical here that we are going to get through this without uh, some pain and injury. Uh, and, and therefore I'm ready and aware. And I think that close, a close watch in every city in the country, which is undergoing this, this cultural shift, um, as it affects offices and affects actually entertainment and activities and retail, et cetera, all of these things going on today. I, I believe that we do not appear to need as much space as we have right now. And therefore we have an overcapacity, which leaves all of this commercial real estate with heavy debt loads, mm-hmm. which have got to be paid. And it leaves cities with property tax bills that have got to be paid. And therefore I, I expect that we will have injury, you might say, to a number of players, including, uh, to the cities themselves and to their tax bases, uh, as well as uh, to those who put these buildings up. Now, whether we can get a recovery or not to the level we would like to see, that's not out of the question. From that standpoint, that's where the developer comes in and believes that he goes through cycles, and they have. And in fact, over those last 40 years that we've been talking about, there's been downturns where there's been overbuilding. You know, the 19, early 1990s, around 89, uh, through the first years of the 90s, we saw a, a overbuilding as that we started to flex our muscle with architectural renaissance. And that came back by the mid uh, 90s. Uh, so those that got in, some of those that actually acquired properties cheaper did very well. And they, they remember that. The industry remembers that. Mm-hmm. We had a similar kind of thing that happened uh, around the time of the financial crisis. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, then by 2013, uh, when the crisis started to be behind us, uh, what you saw is a steady increase in the market valuations of commercial real estate that went on all the way into 2020. So um, I think that uh, right now I'd say that the, that's the most important question you just asked for me was, will we have harm, uh, credit harm, as we like to uh, mm-hmm. focus on? Um, and I would say yes, I would mm-hmm. expect to. But we got to find out where it's going to be and who's most likely, who's most vulnerable. Is it too early to, to go into details and to – uh, try to figure out where either regionally uh, or within regions uh, who's going to be hurt the most. Is it too early to tell right now? Well, it may be that those who get hurt the most are those which um, that are uh, most, least defensive uh, mm-hmm. to this particular problem. Uh, they which those that have the most office space available mm-hmm. that becomes um, a vacant. Uh, that would be a, a factor, for instance. Those that have very uh, high market valuations have the most room to be able to to lose for the most part from the tax base standpoint. So we'll be looking at the wealth of the of the tax base. We'll look at the overbuilding or the uh, the amount of space that's available. Uh, and we will also, in terms of looking who gets injured and how they get injured, We'll be looking at uh, the amount of debt that's uh, held by all the parties involved, all the players, not mm-hmm. only those that hold the loans on these properties, but we're going to be looking at the cities and the counties and the school districts who have uh, levies that are based upon these numbers and are looking for full collections. And so we'll have to look to see what kind of remedies they have and whether they have uh, surpluses sufficient enough to cover mm-hmm. at least early years when the shocks might come in. And one of the things that you wrote about in your report is that, that there is that there are some cities that are a little more or a little less reliant on their ta- top taxpayers. I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about that as well. Well, whenever we one of the reasons we chose to look at the top 10 taxpayers 
is one is the information is available in our database. Mm -hmm. uh, but that alone wasn't, it's not good enough. The fact is that by to looking at the top 10 taxpayers, it's always been an important credit analysis uh, factor, uh, but it seemed to be less so over many years in, in, in more recent history uh, because the, the tax bases became much more diversified. At mm -hmm. one time, they were overly concentrated on industrial customers or utilities. Mm -hmm. um, and those days are, for most part, are in the past, particularly with big cities, but they still matter. And the, and the lower that top 10 taxpayer list is, it's, it becomes representative or indicative of how diversified the entire tax base is of that particular city. So when we look at that right now, Los Angeles comes out as being the most diversified if you look at the top 10 taxpayer list. Now, that's not to say they don't have commercial problems in their downtown. In fact, they do. They have one of the higher uh, vacancy rates on real estate right now, mm -hmm. uh, property that's not leased out and uh, in their in their central districts. Um, so they've got a vulnerability, but the fact is, uh, does it impose any immediate strain or shock should any of those prob properties get reassessed or uh, not able to make their uh, payments on their property taxes? And for the most part here, it would take more of their properties to cause a severe impact on Los Angeles, as it would with, uh, let's say, a city of Detroit who's on the other end of the scale, which is the uh, one of the highest in the, of all cities, but particularly among big, big cities in terms of the dependence on their top 10, uh, which is uh, closer to 28%. Now, albeit they've got a, a, a utility in that list, but the utility also uh, keep, maintains its own solvency based on the strength of its businesses there, but they have among their other two taxpayers, they have a, uh, a gambling and hotel casino, which we know have experienced uh, some changes in both the gaming industry as well as in people wanting to uh, go downtown to stay at a hotel. Uh, so they would be infected possibly, and of course they have a major for-profit system that's among the big three. But we have to take a look at that as being indicative uh, with a relatively weaker uh, wealth-wise uh, tax base being able to handle uh, uh, downturns. And mm -hmm. so they would come out to be on the high side. The point that probably matters more is the one to watch. It's been a city that's done very well in the last decade right. with growth and the right kind of technology firms themselves. And that is Boston, which is number two on our list of the uh, highest dependency on its top 10, uh, mm -hmm. which a number of their top 10, largest of their, of their top 10, in fact, most of them are all real estate uh, entities themselves. So you, that it strengths, it's important that they maintain the strength of that uh, occupancy rate downtown in Boston. Mm -hmm. you, and you specifically wrote that Chicago's central business district mm -hmm. uh, Office vacancy rate is at 18.5% as of the fourth quarter of 2021, mm -hmm. and that vacancy rate uh, bears monitoring. I was wondering, mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us why that's an, uh, an important data point, how it compares to vacancy rates in other cities, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, frankly, just in, in general, just why it bears monitoring? Well, it's a number on the meter that uh, is getting closer to the warning zone here. I think when you get over 20%, we have to worry about the commercial properties in the city in, in a large amount. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not quite there, but they were working towards that. In fact, if those numbers come out over the next uh, few quarters, they're gonna be really important to watch. Uh, Chicago has a, a it, on its top 10, even mm -hmm. though it's not one of the largest dependent on those top 10, um, the fact is that most of their top 10 are all, if not all of them, are all real estate entities. And therefore, if you look at them collectively in, in an aggregate, if they all suffer major haircuts in their valuation levels, it exposes them to risk of reassessment uh, and potentially refunds that will have to be made by the city of Chicago uh, out of their own cash reserves in order to cover for amounts that are levied and distributed to their governing units for payment of their expenses and that have already been paid. And now they've got to come up with money in another following year 
who are going to have to refund on those properties. So it's really mm-hmm. important to see will they hit over 20% and, uh, and when is this never going to come down? So I think, uh, I, I think it deserves um, a scrutiny. Uh, mm-hmm. Just before the crisis, and let me one more point, if you could, Tom, on this, is that Chicago was still seeing in 2020, in terms of that eternal optimism of developers, developers that were making plays for property in the city for office buildings and planning new projects. The question is, will they actually build them now as the as this cultural shift is up for grabs as to whether uh, you have the same number of people that are going to be working downtown as you've had in the past. Right. The last question that I want to ask is about that cultural shift, or at the beginning you even were talking about in referring to this as a severe cultural shift. Uh, in the report, you noted that we're going to witness some sort of restructuring of city life as we have known it in response to these pressures. And I, I'm guessing that this restructuring of city life is it's along the lines of this cultural shift. I'm wondering how it is you you know you're talking about you were you were talking about and comparison and comparing how the folks started to go back to the city uh, a couple of decades ago. Now it sounds as though what you're saying is that this restructuring of city life could very well make it so, correct me if I'm wrong, that people could be uh, staying away from the city. Mm-hmm. Is it is that the kind of restructuring that you're talking about? Well, yes, I think that's true in, in, in most of the uh, big cities, and that's what New York, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera, are all kind of uh, uh, um, uh, focused on this particular risk. Uh, what makes the city the, uh, the engine uh, that it is? Uh, is it's the energy that's not only from the people coming down to the office, but that's people eating in restaurants. It's the travel that comes in for business that stays in the hotels. It's the entertainment that's there for them to attract them in the off hours and on weekends. It's the retail, et cetera. All of those things are, are, have been impacted on a negative side by COVID. And the question is, have people changed their shopping habits that they don't necessarily want to come down to a city to shop anymore, or to the degree that they once did, or whether they don't want to come down as often for work itself, or whether it's uh, for uh, entertainment or to stay in the hotels, we're going to find out. I think everything's going to be done to try to bring people back into the city. And probably in order, just like we had a renaissance in architecture that brought them back into the city back in the 1980s, uh, and it went on and became even more vibrant in the 90s, et cetera, and going forward, is that I think we're going to need something new, something along the lines of a renaissance, even on a social side, that still captures the imagination and energy of young people to want to be downtown and want to be living downtown because it's close to work. And, you know, it may even be a factor that still yet to be played out is that energy costs wouldn't co- don't come down over the next five years. That would be a factor in and of itself of why you want to live in the city, particularly those that are beginning their career. Uh, so that we're going to have to look to see if this time, rather than architecture to be the renaissance, the energy comes from some new social uh, magnet that brings people in. And, and, and we're hopeful that something like that can happen and will make this a short term hit uh for the most vulnerable to be you know the impacts would be for the most vulnerable but we're we're hoping that that's all it will be and it won't be a permanent disruption as the city not only as the heart but as the engine for the metropolitan area that makes sense the uh we'll see how long this cultural shift and the restructuring lasts rich uh thanks very much for joining me today i really enjoyed our discussion i enjoyed talking to you tom thank you And thanks very much to those who tuned in and downloaded our recording today. Uh, We appreciate you uh, spending your time and listening. For those interested, you can see the recent Hilltop Securities Economic and Municipal Commentary and listen to our podcasts by going to hilltopsecurities.com backslash commentary. And you can follow me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. 
Thanks again, everyone. We look forward to bringing you more color in the future related to topics that intersect the worlds of politics, finance, and public finance. This has been Tom Koslick from Hilltop Securities. Thanks for listening to Hilltop Talks, a Hilltop Securities podcast where we navigate the impact of politics and finance on the financial markets. For those interested, you can view our Hilltop Securities economic and municipal commentary by visiting hilltopsecurities.com backslash municipal dash commentary and hilltopsecurities.com backslash economic dash commentary. You can also follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thanks again, everyone, for subscribing, tuning in, and participating. We look forward to bringing you more color in the future on topics that intersect both the world of politics and finance. This has been Tom Koslick at Hilltop Securities. This communication is intended for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice, nor is it an offer or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any investment or other specific product or service. Financial transactions may be dependent upon many factors such as, but not limited to, interest rates, tax rates, supply, and change in laws, rules and regulations, as well as changes in credit quality and rating agency considerations. The effect of such changes in such assumptions may be material and could affect the projected results. Any outcome or result Hilltop Securities or any of its employees may have achieved on behalf of our clients in previous matters does not necessarily indicate similar results can be obtained in the future for current or potential clients. Hilltop Securities makes no claim the use of this communication will assure a successful outcome. For additional information, comments, or questions, please contact Hilltop Securities, Inc. Hilltop Securities is a wholly owned subsidiary of Hilltop Holdings, New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol HTH. Hilltop Securities is located at 717 North Harwood Street, Dallas, Texas, 75201. Phone number 833-4-HILLTOP, H-I-L-L-T-O-P, and is a member of the New York Stock Exchange, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, and the Securities Investor Protection Corporation.